Okay. Hi, everyone. It is October the 21st. And uh, I'm going to share something with you today that, well, it's it's been very interesting for me, and I, I would assume it would be interesting for you. And it concerns George Orwell's final novel, 1984. Like you, you have probably come to believe a certain viewpoint of what this novel is, what Orwell was writing, uh, what its message is. Given the uh, circumstances of our current moment, I decided, well, maybe it's a good time to go back and read 1984, and I'm very glad I have, because it's not its not the book I thought it was at all. To the point that I almost feel like I, I have never read it, or perhaps I've only read it in the past in a hunt-and-search manner, because the book is about something completely different. Everyone thinks the book is a view of a dystopian, controlling future. Actually, the book is being written about the present. The book is being written about the situation in 1948, 1947, 1948, when he was writing, and not, as well, not just about Stalinist Soviet Union which is, again, what a lot of people thought he was writing about. No, he's writing about everywhere in the world. Particularly, he's writing about England, not about the Soviet Union. The fact that the book has a future setting to it is only an indication that everything that would need to have the, kind, have the future that does exist in the book can only happen because all of those things already exist in the present. All of the key things that are important for the creation of the systems of Oceana, right, they're already there. They're already existing in 1947 England. There was already control of thought. There was already a continuous war, overconsumption, lack of beauty, um, lack of eroticism, um, the lack of trusting one's own feeling, uh, being watched and monitored. Yes, it's all changed and improved and been modified and gone into deeper modes because of technology and the advances of technology, but things have all, things were in place at that moment in time. So that's the big reversal when you start reading 1984. At least it's about two different, it, it's, if you can think of 1984 as two different books now, that's kind of how I see it. There, there's a midpoint in the book. And what's interesting, it's, it's the second half of the book that everyone seems to remember most, which is once Winston Smith gets a hold of the, the book, what you might call the information from the rebellious side that's giving the, giving the detail of the structure of the world of Oceana, of Big Brother, of of um, of Double Think, and then the time he spends in the torture tr torture chamber and the reeducation center. That's what everyone remembers. But really, the first half of the book is more important because it's the first half that's giving the underlying foundations that allow such a thing to happen. And this is, it's a very subtle shift that, you know, I certainly missed it whenever I read it 15 years ago. I didn't, I didn't get that actually the first half of the book was critical before you could ever understand the last half of the book. Whatever is being described in the future, and there is, he is putting some, um, he is putting some prophecy into the book, but it's secondary to what he's showing about in the time frame. And more importantly, so that's one key revelation of 1984. The second key revelation is that he's, it's actually a call to rebellion. It's a call for what he calls the proles, right? The proletariat, the working class, the, the downtrodden masses who allow such a controlling, um, society, such a controlling pop, top controlling, um, top parasitic society to exist. It's because the proles 
are not in rebellion. However, he also says that the proles will never rebel. There will never actually be a rebellion, even though in the book, he's actually calling for it and saying if there isn't a rebellion, the rest of 1984, the second half of the book is what you will wind up with. He's kind of writing the book, at least this is my feeling, he's writing the book at a moment of time when he feels there still is some sort of chance of rebellion in the world. And that he's writing it, uh, I guess not so much that he even thinks that it will happen. He's just writing it because he's saying it could happen, and if it could, it would happen now. And that if it doesn't happen now, it won't. I think that's that's a big part of his writing. So he's he's prophetic. He's prophesizing what people believe he's prophesizing, the world of control and Big Brother and technology and constant monitoring and watching. and But... And you, and you can't stop it now, but you could stop it in 1948. And that was his point. That was his key point, I think, to what he was trying to say. There's a couple of small elements <clears throat> I'm going to dig into here. Um, but I, I it, it's really, read the book. It's, it's unbelievably well written. And, and, you know, as an author, as a writer, as someone who works with words, it's one of the things I can... Now I've always been, well, I guess I've always been able to appreciate in some way I've always been a writer. I've always worked with words. So even, even 40 years ago when I was in my teens, I could easily recognize a television program or a movie that was well written, that had very much thought placed into the dialogue. I wasn't so concerned with what actor was doing what. I was looking at what, it, what have the writers placed into the dialogue to create what's there um i was just seeing something i've been watching some old fraser episodes uh the tv show fraser and there's there's three or four perhaps episodes maybe five episodes that are so unbelievably well written just just the 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 way the words are used the way the language is put together the way the inter the plot interactions take place there's a couple of episodes as well of the uh canadian show corner gas that also are extremely well written so i guess i've had this this penchant for good writing, and, and, and this is good writing. Uh, I've also uh, watched a couple of documentaries on Orwell now, going into before doing this, and um, so much of Orwell's life, semi coming from privilege, you know, people try to give this indication of him being part of the underground Illuminati, and who knows, maybe he was, but certainly he spent so much time with the poor. He spent so much time, not just like walking around the streets. I mean, he lived in those, in the conditions with the proles. He, he lived with them. He was in their muck and their mire and the, which in the 1920s and the 1930s, which was in many cases in, in, you know, coal mines and, uh, manufacturing towns of England was, you know, atrocious living. It'd be like third world conditions today. Awful stuff. And he lived through this. So he, what became 1984 is presented out of his own experience. And what he's, what he's seeing the, this sort of the mass of humanity that those at the top see as simply cattle and basically just slaves to, produce the produce the extreme comforts that they want that's all that they see the masses that's all they've ever seen the masses as being but in some way orwell was seeing the possibility of what the masses could do if they could ever rise rise a bit and see clearly the situation of the reality that they were in a big part big part of the second half of 1984 of that that book that winston gets a hold of is the description of how the society is built in such a way that that the proles will never be able to will never be able to gain the clear seeing and the intelligence that they would need for the rebellion to win back their own freedom, so to speak. There's a couple of, like I say, there's a couple of semi key elements though to, to jump in. One is uh, one is a line that says, <clears throat> um, and this is again talking about the masses of humanity. Until they become conscious, they, they will never rebel. But until they have rebelled, 
they cannot become conscious. Uh, very, very important line. And in my book, anyway, in my pocketbook, it's a part of a page, uh, page 74 for me, in which he goes into great detail on, on them, you know, with, with key, with key sentences like, so long as they continued to work and breed, their other activities were without importance. The party taught that the proles were natural inferiors who must be kept in subjugation like animals by the application of a few simple rules. Left to themselves like cattle turned loose on the plains of Argentina, they had reverted to a style of life that appeared to be natural to them, a sort of ancestral pattern. They were born, they grew up in the gutters, they went to work at 12, they passed through a brief blossoming period of beauty and sexual desire, they married at 20, they were middle-aged at 30, they died for the most part at 60. Heavy physical work, the care of home and children, petty quarrels with neighbors, films, football, beer, and above all gambling filled up much of their minds. To keep them in control was not difficult. A few agents of the thought police moved always among them, spreading false rumors and marking down and eliminating the few individuals that were judged capable of becoming dangerous, but no attempt was made to indoctrinate them with the ideology of the party. Now, I also think <clears throat> there's something else being said here about what the party is, what Big Brother is, what the thought police is, and in fact, what the whole last section of the book is, but that's for another, would be for another video or, or, things I'm doing upcoming. It's this one. I'm just, I just want to talk about the first part of the book, the first sort of change that you'll see it differently. Another key element, because again, it, the whole first chapter is about rebellion and there's many different ways to rebel. One of the, one of his quotes is the sexual act successfully performed was a rebellion in itself because a big part of what you might say, what we're calling the party, but we could call today the state or whatever controls this reality, is to reduce the things that are truly human within us in various ways, slowly and slowly over time, and especially, you know, the indoctrination of us as children right from the moment of school. School's a very goofball word, right? Because it's Another, when you think of the word school, you can say a school of fish, just a giant a conglomerate of fish that just move together as a group. And that's school is just an indoctrination point. And it's indoctrinating the removal of the human, true human thought pattern, true human, what you might call individual greatness and sucking it and, and, and moving it into a in a sense, a soul sucking group. It's creating a, it's creating the very mental environment that will allow the louche taking to happen. And so for him, something like, and he says, he says, key, it was the sexual act su uh, successfully performed. So it's not just having sex. That's, that would be again part of the indoctrination. So it's another example of something he's describing that there's, there's, there's certain human ways of being that are that will create a deeper a deeper connection to that which we really are which of course as soon as you do that every little moment is then a disconnect from the entire system that's a, that's constantly being placed over us um another of the famous quotes and and I think it's Goethe right who says who said the quote something like um right so his quote Goethe's quote very clearly the only way to deal with an unfree world is to become so absolutely free that your very existence is an act of rebellion. So I think this is kind of where the book is going, and the story of Winston, one way or another, is the is the attempt to become is his attempt to be free um, in everything that he's doing, which in itself is the act of rebellion. The more free you allow yourself to be, that's rebellion. You don't have to pick up guns and blow things up. You're just, your attempt at freedom, your attempt at your complete ultimate freedom is, is the true act of rebellion within this reality. A lot of that first part of the book is also going through, of course, the erasure of the past, or, or not even the erasure. It's the erasing and the 
reinventing, representing the past so that the present that is wanted to be said is what will be true. What you will find if you go looking in the past will only be what the present tells you it's supposed to be. And again, he's not talking about the future, even though you might say the system has gotten better at it because of technology. That's always been going on. The past has always been invented. And in fact, because we don't really know anything about, the, we know nothing about the past, zero. As all of the work I've done with exposing the expositions and, and all the work that's being done on what's called the mud flood, Tartaria, whatever you want to call it, even through all my work with ancient Egypt, it's indicating very clearly we have no clue about the past, zero. And whatever's being presented to us is just a, it's a made up story. Every time you look into it, even when I looked, we just wrote the hockey book. Someone say, why did you just spend all this time writing a hockey book? Well, I wrote it because I liked it, actually. It was like, you know, like, why, why did you build a deck? Why did you fix your car? Why did you, you know, something I like to do. So it, it just, it was, but in the course of doing that, I realized, yeah, here's another part of history that's obviously made up. It's not true. What is true? I don't know, but it's not what, it's not the story that we get presented. And he's already telling you that. And he's telling you subtly in here that what you think the 1800s was, that's kind of the, the time frame specifically he's, he's touching on mostly. He's telling you it's, it's made up. He's telling you it's a lie. All that is in and more is in the first half of the book. And like I say, in, in an extremely well written, very clear, kind of language. If you have 1984 at home and you haven't read it for a while, I highly recommend pick up the book, reread it, and just for the sake of testing my argument, look through it again as though what if Orwell's not trying to tell you about a scary dystopian future per se, he's trying to tell you about the scary present, the time he's actually and everyone is living and the people who would be reading the book when it first came out, this is their reality. and. Whatever the reality we've got now is only here because those in 1948 didn't see through the system of deception and lies that was upon them and in their great chance of rebellion didn't do anything. I just finished listening today to a part of a, one of Mark's forever, new forever conscious research um, videos that he did with Dan. Uh, what's Dan? With the Overwatch channel, right? And they were talking about, uh, they were going through some George Carlin stuff. You can it, you can see it. It's the most recent video that he's done. And the most important part of the, of the whole thing was a, a one line that George Carlin gave in an interview, which was uh, something to the effect, if you believe there is a solution, then you're part of the problem. If you believe that there is a solution, you're a part of the problem. And that is one of the biggest, or that's, yeah, that's maybe at the top. I mean, he's brilliant. George Carlin just presented one way or another a piece of the soul trap without even realizing that that's what he was doing because I don't think he necessarily believed in a soul trap or reincarnation or any of these things that are going on, right? But he he could see the way that the reality was structured and the stupidity of it and the fact that it will never get better. That this reality has always got worse and worse and worse and worse. And that's the one thing the rewriting of history is doing. The rewriting of history has to make history look terrible. It has to try to present it in such a way so that people look in the mirror and say, we're the best. We well, Look at how we've evolved. Evolution and history absolutely go together. In fact, the the history we know of can't exist until Charles Darwin. Literally, Charles Darwin and history go together. That, 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 that concept of an evolving species and it always getting better. That's a key part of evolution. It's always getting better. That's how history is built. History is built on that to show people in the past, dimwit, idiot, savages, living in, living in squalor, uh, you know, um, dragging stones with ropes, uh, not having dishwashers and and machines and whatever, and so they're inferior. When 
Of course, that's nowhere near the truth. That is the truth that's required so that people don't look at the shitty existence they've got or realize that things were actually probably a thousand times better a thousand years ago on all levels, spiritually, mentally, emotionally, from the standpoint of power, existence, energy, vitality. We, we, everything is always going downhill. And the belief that you can fix it the belief that it even can be fixed is one of the ways that this thing keeps continuing and spiraling into the quicksand. So that little quote from George Carlin that Dan and, and, and Mark brought in that video was so, is, 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 it ties in with 1984 because it's kind of what he's saying. He's saying, you know, this was your time, but it's not going to happen. He knows, he, he's writing it even though saying, the world needs a giant rebellion in 1948, but he gives a whole lot of reasons of why it just can't happen. It's just not going to happen. And the end result will be the rest of what he describes in 1984, which is where we are. And which makes the discussion of the soul trap and the discussion of all this so important because it's, it indicates, well then, where should we put our energy and our focus? And of course, the only place to put our energy and our focus is turning it withinward, turning it towards our true self, turning it towards ultimate truth, ultimate freedom, and ultimate knowledge, ultimate clarity, so that we can totally return to what we are. There's no other, there's no other value or purpose in this place. Everything else is a distraction. And we have to see that we can we can be of value here and we can be of help here and we can be of use here and we can be of friendship here, but it's not going to make here better. It's just going to make the journey for hopefully us and a few others that we associate with not so much better per se or not so much happier, but clearer, more focused, more intent and raising the, raising the, um, possibility that we will all who are you might say in our circle of friends reach reach our ultimate goal it's all there in 1984 as far as i'm concerned so um i would go and read this book if you if you have it around or if you don't pick it up somewhere it's it's really well written and just like i say play with it pretend like okay what if what if i'm right and he's writing about the few of the present not the future so much how does that, and, and writing about what would then be not the past of the book, but the past of those in 1948 reading that book. I think you might see, especially the first half, you might see it in, you might see it as very different than what you may have always thought the book was. I'll leave it there. Thanks everybody for joining. Um, always working on new projects, always working on new stuff. Um, for those of you, particularly from Canada, who are interested in the hockey book, it's still, for some reason, it's very slow getting to the, um, getting to the bookstores in Canada, which is very strange. I don't know why that is, but I've, I've been in contact. It should, within the next week, should be fully available at all the Canadian booksellers. And, um, yeah, we'll move on from there. Um, <clears throat> I did a couple of more conversations with uh, my friend Nori Okushi. That's over on my locals channel, so you're always welcome to go over there and join that and hear what uh, Norio has to say. And um, yeah, as always, be ready, be alert, be clear. And as as the craziness appears in the world around us, use it to go inward and find more inner sanity. Cheers. <laughs>